Good afternoon and welcome back everyone. The topic for this afternoon's plenary is going to going back to the tabula rasa. I know this is a session many of us have been looking forward to. So let me quickly get some logistics out of the way. We would like to try something slightly different for the session. Please go ahead and, uh, and ask all your questions on the Q&A tab. The audience will have the option to endorse the questions that they like. The top three questions will be answered live in the session. And without any further delay, let's get started with the plenary. It is an absolute pleasure and an honor to have with us today, Nobel Peace Laureate and founder of Grameen Bank, Dr. Mohammed Yunus. Hello. Hi, I'm here. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Hosting Dr. Yunus in this fireside chat, we have Mr. Arun Seth. Mr. Seth is the ex-chairman of British Telecom India and Alcatent Lucille, of NASCOM and is a trustee of NASCOM Foundation. He's also served on the boards of several leading companies, including Narayan Radhyalaya and Jubilant Foodworks, and nonprofits like Helpage India and The Nudge. Welcome, Arun, sir, and over to you to introduce Dr. Yunus and take the discussion forward. Thank you, Lakshmi. Uh, Dr. Yunus, what a privilege uh -huh. to be hosting you on this uh, fireside chat. Fires are outside, hopefully not inside us. <laughs> I hope so. so. Yeah, and we hope that what you'll be able to do is douse some of the fires outside and give us some guidance. So I don't think you need any more introduction. You just, you're a, uh, a legend in your own uh, right. So I'm not going to spend time in telling about the number of awards, but all I can say is he has a, his long bio data is 33 pages. So I'm not going to try to get there at, at, at all, Dr. Yunus. So your words of wisdom will be really what we want. So what I would suggest is that like, if you could talk to us for about 12 to 15 minutes, and then, then I'll ask a few questions which I have, and then we'll open it to the audience questions. Okay. Well, you, know, you know the background, as you said, Keith, this whole thing is of going back to the tabula rasa, to the, to the restart, to, or to reset, or whatever you may like to call it. Yeah, let me try. But, uh, I'm very happy to be with you, uh, Arun, and also all the other participants. And I've been uh, talking about the situation uh, of uh, the world and also in Bangladesh uh, because of the uh, uh, pandemic and what uh, it has done to us and what possibilities is, it has opened up for us. And uh, let me just touch on the subject uh, of uh, vaccine, which is in everybody's mind that uh, we see vaccine somehow will uh, bring us uh, to a point where it can turn around. Uh, but who got the vaccine? Uh, There's interesting news yesterday was uh, Sanofi had a big announcement mm -hmm. that uh, uh, they will be producing vaccine as soon as they do. All the first productions will go to United States. And they made it very clear on that. They said the United States paid them a lot of money, so vaccine has to go to United States. Uh, that made the French people furious because this is a French company and the French government very furious. Of course, the whole world very furious too. Uh, why should they? Uh, French people had a good argument because government has poured in lots of money into Sanofi in development of uh, vaccine. So then our question is, uh, if you have an, uh, an, an environment where companies can decide who should live and who should die or who should be protected, uh, that's not the way uh, the world is going to go along. So we have to be clear right from the beginning, and I've been talking about it, I'm sure you'll be doing it your own way, um, to how to make uh, this is as an open source. Vaccines should be open source product. This is a, a mm -hmm. product for uh, life, for survival. And it should not, cannot be owned by a company. Company decides who to give and at what price, at what time, and how much amount, and so on. It cannot be done that. It cannot be going on like that. Five big uh, pharmaceutical companies literally uh, control uh, the vaccines, uh, besides all other medicines, which is again the same story. Uh, why should it be? So, for the vaccine part, it should be a global uh, good, it should be a 
a global common good. It should have access to everybody and it should be open, open source. It shouldn't be restricted to any patent right on that. Uh, that decision has to be taken now because tomorrow it will be late. Tomorrow will, there'll be mm -hmm. 8 billion uh, uh, vaccines should be used in the world because 8 billion people are here. So uh, potentially everybody will be using the vaccine to protect themselves for the onslaught of uh, Corona uh, virus. So this is one issue uh, right in front of us and we have to raise our voice and make sure how to make that work. And there are many ways, one of the issues that I've been discussing, I've been uh, practicing myself called social business, uh, business to solve problem rather than make any personal money. And we have been doing it and uh, it has uh, idea has spread in some ways, some countries. Uh, this is a very good subject of social business where uh, you, you raise money, you investment money, you produce, you even invest money for de uh, developing uh, vaccines and then you produce it and not for making any money at all for personal reasons. It's just, just to be sustainable and make sure uh, everybody gets to it, governments and others can find it to distribute it free in their own country. And so uh, the company just simply produces it the best quality possible, quickest way the possible and so on. So those kind of institutions, those kinds of uh, businesses have to be uh, developed right now so that uh, we free the medicine. Uh, almost half the cost of healthcare is on medicine. And this is controlled by few companies. And, uh, and when it is controlled by few mm -hmm. companies, lots of uh, issues come up that uh, uh, the misuse of the uh, uh, medicines and the uh, medicine not being available at the right time, at the right place, at the right price, and so, so on. So why should we at the disposal, uh, uh, we should make our life at the disposal of uh, companies to decide how to do that. So we should take it away, uh, give it uh, a chance that everybody can do that. It's not, it's not uh, something that should be limited to uh, several companies and so on. So this is one issue that I would to, like to pinpoint right away. Another one that I uh, was discussing, the life versus livelihood issue, which became very strong. It came, uh, it, uh, Donald Trump made it a big issue and then uh, it became a Western issue. Now we are debating on that issue. Uh, to me, it's a non-issue. Uh, life doesn't have, a, uh, have something to be traded with. It cannot be a traded subject. It's a life, has a, it's, it's a, a primacy of life has to be accepted first life first before anything else uh, and life is unique it has to be protected by all means uh, but the livelihood is something uh, which has lots of option life doesn't have an option either you are alive or you are dead a livelihood has many options but it is put as if uh, this is kind of one-on-one -on -one correspondence between the two uh, either you have a life or you have a life it's not like that life remains and we see what the livelihood options are there are many options, livelihood options. You can provide food, free food, and uh, uh, subsidized food, ration card foods, even uh, channeling money to uh, banking channels so that people can get it. We are, uh, with India, it's a lucky situation with Ada. Everybody has an Ada number. All we have to do is share these Ada numbers with the families. Uh, each family, each person can take care of several or one uh, Ada number. That This is Ada number that I take care of. And I provide uh, for, uh, out of my bank account, out of my own resources, send the money to this particular family and do that. And many people will do that. Uh, and com corporations can do that. Individuals can do that. It, one doesn't have to be a rich person to take care of one person or other. So all you need is uh, adopt an uh, other number. And the whole uh, India is taken care of. It's, uh, uh, even government doesn't have to get involved. So there are many options. This is, an, this is something, I'm sure there are brighter ideas of that, but India provides a uh, very interesting case where it can be done. Uh, it, it, to give you a, a clear picture, see, the, when we talk about artificial intelligence, I've been debating about it, I've been raising uh, my worries about artificial intelligence. I'm saying artificial intelligence, the way it's going, is going to destroy the whole world uh, because it will remove human being from uh, its employment or from its job. So we'll have a massive unemployment coming up very quickly. And we don't know what to do with that. 
And the people who are promoting the idea of artificial intelligence, they are very quick. They say, no, don't, don't worry about that. Uh, we, this is solved uh, because uh, all the people uh, who will be out of job will be taken care of universal basic income. Everybody has to have universal basic income. Government should provide them the basic income and so on. But when Corona does the same thing, creates a loss of unemployment, massive unemployment, nobody talks about universal basic income. Why? Uh, in one case, you are very enthusiastic about sol solving the problem as, as if this is done. But in the Corona case, you don't do that. So there is some kind of mismatch wh wh where your interest is. In one case, you become very um, vocal. In other case, you qu keep quiet. So this is not an issue. This issue is to protect people. And we can take, uh, we have to find other alternatives how to make sure uh, the people have in, uh, either finance or um, income for themselves so that, or food for themselves so that they can continue. The last point on this issue I will mention about the, my worry about the corona situation. Uh, as soon as the corona situation will be over, um, then the whole world will try to get back to the same old thing that uh, they've been doing before, meaning that pre-corona, they want to go back to the pre-corona stage. Uh, I said, why do you want to go back to the pre-corona stage? That was a terrible world. We are lucky that we are away from that. And Corona, in a way, after all those massive uh, damages it has done to people and uh, to the uh, societies and uh, economy and so on. But one good thing it has done, it has destroyed the world that we were trying to destroy anyway, uh, or itself was destroying it, uh, the world uh, by its own deed. Uh, we were complaining about uh, uh, global warming. We uh, almost gave a little time, window of time that we have, uh, two decades or three decades, and it's all over. And the young people are marching on the street saying that uh, you don't have a life for us. You, uh, you adults, have, uh, uh, older generation has taken away our life from us uh, because there is no world to live in. And then uh, grandchildren, uh, unborn grandchildren, uh, probably will not have any life at all. So that's the kind of uh, world that we left behind, and we don't want to go back to that world. And that's not the only thing with global, uh, global warming, uh, where uh, we said that this is the last decade, uh, or it is the decade of the last chance uh, to uh, fix the world. Otherwise, if you miss this decade, which is the current decade, uh, there's nothing we can do. We're just jumping off the cliff and it's all over, it's, and the time is over. And the other one is extreme wealth concentration. And India is no different than any other country. Extreme, extreme wealth concentration taking place every second. Uh, so every moment is taken. The machine that we build, what we call economy, is a machine to suck up all the wealth and push it in one direction. And that's not the machine that we want to go back to. Uh, wealth concentration, I've been calling it a ticking time bomb. It will explode uh, and destroy uh, everything that we got so far. So uh, that's not the explosive situation that we would like to go back to. And the third one is, of course, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And I've been reminding that uh, technology can be a blessing, technology can be a curse. I said, uh, the side of uh, artificial intelligence, which is growing very fast and with lots of enthusiasm mm -hmm. for money-making people uh, is the curse direction of the uh, artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence can be a blessing and we realize it during the uh, coronavirus pandemic period that uh, all the healthcare can be brought to the, uh, brought to by uh, artificial intelligence in such a nice way and monitor the whole system of coronavirus expansion, location, con uh, concentration can be done, uh, beautifully done and uh, appropriate actions can be taken and preparations can be taken. But that's not what we did with the artificial intelligence. We want to replace people in a hurry uh, so that uh, our cost of production goes down, our bottom line gets better, uh, bigger, and we make a lot of money. Who cares for the people losing jobs and so on and so forth. So all these things you know, combining was the result of the world that we left behind. We don't want to go back to that world. This is a disaster path. This is the path where we, uh, it's, it's a frying pan. We don't want to jump into the frying pan that we came out of. So let's make a different world. That's a whole issue. We had to do the rethinking, redesigning, uh, uh, re-institutionalizing everything, create new institutions. We don't take any of the old stuff. So what are the things we must abandon? We must uh, take them, uh, uh, leave them behind forever. 
and what are the things we can select, we can uh, modify and take it with us, and what are the new things we have to build so that the new pillars of the societies can be built. And we can create a world that we want, and that's our choice. And this is the choice given to us right now. So uh, we exercise that choice, make a new world for us, and I'll stop here. Thank you. No, no, we are bang on time. Uh, we didn't require any AI for that, Doctor. <laughs> Thank and you. The only thing I would uh, say, uh, hearing you, is as long as we don't put Corona in a pantheon of gods, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see. It. We do not need that. Yeah. <laughs> so we have uh, one of our gods as the destroyer, but uh, this is not what. But that's with a creative, creative basis. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. So I think you answered one of my first uh, questions as uh, well, should we pivot or perish, as we say in the startup world. You're just saying we just pivot. We do not go back to what we were doing. Right. And I think that's one big lesson for all the audience that's listening and. Uh, uh, so that, and, and that's going to be a sort of debate for all the other issues that we are going to be discussing. The second issue, which I uh, heard one of your talks, was that man, man was not somehow built to do a job. This is one of your talks I've heard. And uh, so, how, how, and now with so much unemployment which is there, I mean, all over the place, how do we make entrepreneurs? out of all the people, if there are no jobs in the old traditional sense, how do we make people into entrepreneurs with your social business, with the kind of experience you have building social businesses? How do we create, bring out the spirit of entrepreneurship, which is critical for creating the new world? Yeah, the way I try to bring it uh, to the attention that uh, human beings are not born uh, to work for somebody else. Yeah. Human beings is a free entity. Uh, they do things what they want, and that's our history. From if you go back in history, uh, we were um, farmers, we were go-getters, we were hunters, gatherers. Uh, we are not working for anybody. We are together. We uh, take uh, care of ourselves and uh, fought the uh, adversity in life and in nature, and, and make our place and succeeded in doing that. And I keep uh, saying that if, when we're in the caves, uh, we are not sending job applications to anybody. Uh, we mm -hmm. just did what needed to be done. So when did this job idea came? Very recently. So it's not something, a legacy that we are carrying. Uh, it, it is it's convenient uh, for the theoreticians who made up the theory that uh, runs the economy today to figure out there'll be some entrepreneurs and there'll be bulk of people who will be working for them. Uh, and that's what suits them. So we have been trained from the birth that uh, you grow up, you go to school and get ready to get a job. If you don't get a job, very bad luck. You're unfortunate, you're an unemployed person. I said the whole problem of unemployment is created by creating the concept of employment. If we didn't have the concept of employment, there is no unemployment. We'll be surviving, we'll be doing our own things. We That's why we're equipped, it. but somehow we are pushed into thinking that I have to have a job. I said, at least give people option. And our education system is again promoting that, that you have to have a job. Uh, many universities, uh, uh, centers of learning, pride themselves by saying, uh, we prepare job ready young people. I said, that's a shame to say you prepare job ready young people. You should be preparing life ready young people, not job ready young people. Uh, in, the, uh, in all education and institutions, uh, every ch single child should be given an option. Uh, say, uh, take, uh, tell them that they have two options. They can be a job seeker and work for somebody. I'm not denying that if you want to, but they can also be an entrepreneur. If you want to take the track of job seeking, this is what you do, this is what you prepare. If you want to be an entrepreneur, this is what you do. And we, because we believed in employment as the solution to all the problems, because you don't have to worry about the entrepreneurship. So we created an entire financial system to do that. If there's an unemployed person today, anywhere in the world, not only in Bangladesh or India, anywhere in the world, if he or she is looking for some investment money uh, to start uh, the business, no financial institution will come forward and uh, give that from, provide, provide that money. I said, why not? And uh, I challenged that and he created those financial institutions, which gives the money equity uh, in the hands of the 
uh, unemployed young people say you go ahead you design your business and uh, continue your business in business uh, also means business uh, to fail business is not always 100% guaranteed success and we have our financial institution will be behind you and make sure that uh, you continue with your that's, uh, that's really good though, go to the success level and then come a couple of other every day may i ask a couple of other small questions go ahead thank you so so one of the things you said since we don't want to go back to the old world which was all about urbanization and so on and so forth i remember what mahatma gandhi and dr abdul kalam and all said about going back to the villages is this our chance to use technology to cre- recreate a new world back in the villages rather than in urban centers uh, technology is uh, a fantastic thing it's a it is it's a is something enables you it's a tool first you have to figure out what you want to use this tool for yeah. so that's a crucial issue and why why do you design this tool is it a designer has the idea who you need this for what purpose so if you are explaining to your problem designer will come up with a design which will exactly fits your need so it's not the village of the uh, city the whole design of the economy is wrong so what you have done uh, you create a concentration of all your economic activity one place call it urban center so village doesn't have anything and you told every young person that you have to have a job and you go to farmers to get a job he says i have enough i have a machine now i don't need you so what do i do as a young person i go to the city because that's how they have the job because i have i have to have a job this is my survival issue so you drilled into my head that i have to have a job and you, you make everything blocked out from me no no other option you left for me if i knew i could be an entrepreneur i would not be coming to the city i see lots of opportunity in the village to do things and i will bring the city in my village why should i go to the city to be, be there so technology will help me i said i'll serve you out of my own home in my village i'm a, i have a brilliant idea you get my service right there on your doorstep and exactly the way i compete with all the urban guys that are doing to you because today my presence physical presence is not needed and there are so many other ideas will come and technology can help me in doing that and i can uh, i can store your products in village in safe way clear way half the price that you pay in your urban city so i give a warehouse business for you i do all kinds of sorting things for you uh, and i do it uh, much cheaper much easier and so on. give me the chance but the economy doesn't give you the chance finance doesn't give you the chance finance is always financing people who already have lots of money that's the financial system the, the, the financial system is the vehicle of the wealth concentration so unless you redesign the financial system wealth concentration will continue we can reverse the financial system make the finance to flow into the people who need the money for survival and expand their creative power all human beings are so much packed with uh, creative power the guy is sitting in the village uh, looks stupid he's a brilliant guy in terms of ideas and things but he has no way to express it this is yeah. the problem that's where the technology has to come thank you that's really wonderful news and uh... you know uh, i mean uh, uh, me i certainly come from the technology world and this gives us the aspiration of what to do next to thank you to, to, to me lots of things to be done and the technology yeah. one of the other questions i have like you have the million sdgs and the md millennium development goals which are divided into 12 to 16 different things so we have a crisis which we are going through and we have a situation where a lot of the money is gone in in our country your country into fighting covid and then uh, doing people so there's less money left for doing social development and all so what what would be your thought that should we be doing all the things as we did before clearly not you've already taken the side that you can't go back to that world so what would be the priorities amongst the goals are right the question is what are the priorities for this for the next six months next 12 months then for the next six months next 12 months the only thing to be do to do is to prepare not to go back <laughs> that's the priority this need lot of thinking lots of rethinking it's automatically you'll not be there so all the designing has to be done now what are the as i said what are the things we have want to leave behind this is the time to decide for example uh, we don't want to take any fossil fuel with us because that's a, that's a crime that we were carrying that will bring the whole world world with us so we stop the no fossil fuel coal oil or anything will go with us it stays here and remains buried here with the coronavirus it will not go and that is a hard decision we have to take 
and make sure we make, we want to make sure plastic will not go with us because plastic was destroying us. So we have to decide if without plastic, how do we design our life and so on our, um, without plastic. We lived without plastic, for God's sake. This is not that we are born in, in the world. Adam and Eve was born with the plastic was with them and they take care of it. It's not like this, it came the other way. Suddenly it, take, it took over our life, now it's killing us. So we decide that plastic will not go with us. So we have to have a make a list of things which we do not want to do and find out what are the new things we do. For example, we don't want the uh, financial institutions to go with us, not in the way they do it. We have to redesign the entire financial system and make sure the uh, bulk of this financial system is driven by social businesses, not with the profit-making businesses. They are blinded by uh, profit, they are smelling profit, so they go crazy after the money. So if you can create, I'm not blocking them out right away, I'm saying that you create a space for social businesses so that people who want to do things, solve people's problem, they can do it as a social business. It's a business, sustainable business, but nobody's interested in making personal money out of it. Uh, this is uh, something which covers the cost and serves the people in solving problems. So we create the institution which solves the problem. Priority is not my priority right now. Priority is a thinking priority. Imagination is a priority. We have to imagine, we have to fictionalize what the world would be like. Once we, fiction is an imagination. Once we know how to design the fiction, we know how to create the reality. You are a, uh, a technology person. All technologies start with fiction. Why can't we call somebody from here and he will listen to another? That's a fiction made a reality. You can get a telephone call. Otherwise, it wouldn't be. So everything comes with fiction. Fiction is something very important. This is the time for us, every home, every person, create those fictions so that we can transform them into reality and create a new world. A world where there'll be no global warming. We, global warming will not be there. We want to 100% make sure this is, this is the end of the global world. And this will be a world where there will be no wealth concentration. We turn around the wealth concentration. All the wealth that went up is going to come down now. Uh, we have designed it. It's like designing a software. You have a problem, you design a software. So you design a software so that how to make the system work, the coding will be done so that all the money that went to the one direction, they start coming to another direction so that we share the wealth not monopolize the world to do that and how to stop the uh, um, artificial intelligence to go in the wrong way bring it to the right way we have been doing, yeah you need it yourself help your question about artificial intelligence. can i flip your question of artificial intelligence the other way around a lot of yeah. young people wanted to go back into the finance world that you said we shouldn't be going into how do we get that mind they all want to donate their money now to social causes but how do we get their mind now into creating this new world. I'm, we got their money through donations and other things, but how do we get those same young people? Because if we have the right talent, I mean, the same people, everybody applies their mind to the new world. How do, what do you have to, to these young people who will make this new world? People like me are, are done with. <laughs> Very much needed. All the experience. Need to, go. <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the young people that I try to convince them uh, by saying that, uh, you are the most powerful generation in human history. So that shocks them that we are the most powerful generation in human history. I said, not because you are smart, smarter than our generation, our previous generation. We are the same people. Each human being is packed with unlimited creative capacity. And you have also have the same trait. You are packed with unlimited creative capacity. But the difference that makes between you and you, uh, me is that you are, you are born with technology in your hand. I was not born with technology in my hand. We used to write in long hand in a piece of paper and stuff it in a news in an envelope and leak a stamp and put it in the envelope and mail it in a mailbox and wait for months to get a reply. You do it instantly. That's the speed that you brought. So I said, if you are aware that all the uh, energy, all the power that you have that nobody else ever had, you're the first generation to have all this power. Simple question for you. What are you going to use this power for? If you decide where this power is going to make use of it. If you are not thinking about this, this power, you had it, it will be wasted. Uh, tell them that you have the Aladdin's lamp in your hand, but you never touched that Aladdin's lamp. Genie never came out. And you never asked the genie what to do. So nothing happened. It's just like another lamp. So you have to be 
aware that you have a genie in your hand. Today, I'll say not in your hand, you are the genie, but you're not aware of it. If you're a genie, do it. You can do things which no other generation ever did, but you look like the same old guy. It's, you are not the same old guy. We are a very different breed of people today. So make use of it, change the world which fits you, not the world that you have to live where your grandparents and your parents live. That's old world, that's a dangerous world. You don't have to go back there. You create, and Corona has provided the opportunity to do that. Please make use of it. Come and do it. And you are as good as anybody else. Don't wait for a brilliant guy to come. Everybody is brilliant. Simply, occasion makes you brilliant, not something that you carry with you. Your circumstances, your environment that you create for yourself makes you brilliant because you do things which nobody else did. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. You know, so I've done, I've got one question left, which I'll ask you last, later on. Okay. Okay. We have questions from the audience who have actually curated okay. and they voted for these questions. So you're going to get things which the audience really wants, not what I right. want. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, so this Mr. Vijay, Vinay Mathur has asked a question. What do you think about introducing medical care as subject in elementary education syllabus to avoid such situations as today? Uh, health is always part of education in primary school and health hygiene, we used to call them hygiene. I'm sure it's the same thing here, a much more advanced version. But it's, a, it's an awareness about life, awareness about uh, how to make a good life, uh, what is a healthy food. The food is another item uh, that we don't want to take from uh, old world to the new world. Uh, for example, all the cattle, all the beef eating, and, and that's causing all the uh, global warming problems. So why should we get attached to the meat and continue to eat meat and create problem for us? So those kind of things, what do we eat, which is, can, which is right for the world, right for the body, and uh, it's, can, it's, it's something healthy for all of us. Those kind of ideas. So we had that, when you talk about the cleanliness, when you talk about the sanitation, for, these are part of the growing up process. Uh, why is it harmful if I do something uh, to other people? And how do I not do things which makes other people's life endangered? Those things, those norms have to be done. And then along with it, how I can protect people uh, from the problem that uh, is created, what my responsibility is. Because I have to understand, it's not me alone. Uh, the current, current world is, is a me, me world. I'm the only one. I don't care for others. That mentality has to go. We have to share, we have to participate, we have to take is a, is a, uh, a global interest, total interest, rather than a self-interest. Self-interest will be a part of it, but not the whole of it. The whole of it will be the common interest so that we can stay together and make it happen. So healthcare is an essential item. And with the, all the technology, all the new inventions that are happening, uh, healthcare, people can have a beautiful life, healthy life for a long, long time if we behave ourselves in the right way. Thank you. That's really a great answer. Vinay, I hope you got your answer from Dr. Yunus. Uh, the second question is, considering the fact of job losses and liquidity concerns, what role will the microfinance companies play in issuing additional micro loans and recovery of the existing loans? How will this exist, affect the existing microfinance companies itself? The first of all, I want to point out microfinance was the defiance of the conventional finance. Uh, microfinance didn't exist. Uh, we dared to defy their rules. They said, you cannot do that. We said, we can do that. Of course, I don't have to take orders from you. They said, you cannot do banking without collateral. I said, forget about collateral because collateral is kind of building a wall uh, in front of the poor people so that they cannot enter our territory. So destroy that wall so that we can serve you as, as good as anybody else. So that's where the starting point of uh, microfinance is. Uh, that has shown the first block, of building block, that you had create entire uh, uh, financial system on top of all those defiance issues. So you go and defy all the norms that have been set up. So I was mentioning about unemployed young people. Unemployed young people uh, not being able to access equity, small equity, they need to start the business. Uh, nobody will do that because uh, you don't have anything in your hand to uh, bring it to collateral. Neither your family has anything to provide you for that. So uh, the, your, your finance will deny you. I said, no, we create a financial system which doesn't talk about the collateral. It's a, it's a no no. And build the whole system. And we did. We created social business venture capital fund. You know, the conventional venture capital fund, you are willing to 
make money out of you because you have an idea, I give you the money and I take bulk of the profit that you get. So we created social business venture capital, which is different. We said, we are not interested in making profit out of you. Profit, whatever you make is yours. Only thing you return what I gave you, plus a little bit of service charge, tiny little, so that I can cover my cost, survival cost. That's all. That's it. We don't want, and young people love that. This is so easy. And so even if you fail, we'll still continue with you and we are not abandoning you. So we have a basic policy. We don't abandon anybody and we don't reject anybody. So to us, everybody has, people say, how do you know he's a, whether he's an entrepreneurial material? I said, I don't have to know. He, as long as he's a human being, I know human being is good for entrepreneurship. So he, said, he needs to get a chance. So I give him a chance and he takes a chance and he shows it up. And this is a, so the entire financial system will be moving. So with the microfinance right now, microfinance has uh, taken uh, two different shapes, uh, uh, unfortunately. Uh, some microfinance has pushed into, push itself into uh, loan sharking part make money out of it. And uh, luckily, the central bank has imposed, RBI has imposed uh, interest cap and so on and so forth. But still, there are many other ways to get money out of people. So I said, that's not the intention of microcredit. Microcredit is a social business. We created microcredit to help people to get out of the situation they are in and not to make money for ourselves. So this is one area that we, uh, this is a chance and create lots of social business microfinance area so that we can continue with helping people getting out. And there are many other programs that we have developed during the disaster period. Uh, we didn't have the coronavirus before, but we had all the cyclones in Bangladesh, all the floods in Bangladesh. Uh, some of the floods were nationwide floods, microfinance. We knew how to survive out of this when you lose everything, your house, your cattle, your possessions, everything gone. But we build it up. We said, okay, don't worry about paying us money back. Our job is to put you back on your feet. Once you are back on our feet, let's talk how to re uh, reorganize everything, the past debts and so on, how much you pay now, how much you pay later. But we don't want to put a burden on you which you cannot carry. We'll willingly, whatever you can do, we, will, we are in a long-term relationship here. Okay. And you own the bank itself. So we don't worry about bank is coming to destroy you. So it's, you have to work together. So this is the attitude. There are many issues now that we, are, we can understand. First of all, that uh, uh, in, in a situation like that, what the Grameen Bank response would be, forget about the old loans. Let's start a new, because we had a lot of problem. So we start, so it's not about uh, pushing you to give money, money back, his interest, his capital uh, principle that you have to pay. Don't worry about that. We block that out. Let's build the world from the scratch. And once you are capable of handling the past, then we come back how much of it we can handle, how much we cannot handle, how do you settle it, how to make the bank running again, and so that uh, it's not uh, dead. The bank has to run, you have to run, where our life is uh, uh, integrated together. So that's how the microfinance. Thank you. The whole world has to be, uh, expansion of the financial system has to be complete. Nobody should be excluded from the financial system. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you've been polite to the male gender because actually the women who made this happen. No. Absolutely. 97% <laughs> 90, of programming borrowers are women. And no. uh, wherever it went, it became 100% women. And it's, uh, globally, it has uh, shown that the people who cannot believe that women can do such a thing yep. in countries like the United States, extremely poor women, joined Grameen Bank. Now we have more than 200,000 women in Grameen America. Uh, mostly un undocumented women. One last, one last question. Is on money, they pay back. We have been lending money in billions of dollars in tiny, tiny loan under thousand dollars, and they pay back hundred percent. We had no problem. Very good, sir. So one last question is there: How do you think that the problem of mobility could be solved, which is faced by many people from the informal sector? And where do you think our system is lacking? Uh, mobility, meaning social mobility or physical mobility? Physical, social, that's my view. Yeah, well, it's a uh, profound one. Social mobility, social mobility is facilitated by the institutions and policies and so on, education system. Uh, so if you have the education system open to us, I learn everything, I know what to go. And if it's not job-oriented world, then I don't much care about the education, what kind of stamp I have on my paper, that the diploma, which is cool. That doesn't matter because in, if, you are an, if you are an entrepreneur, you don't need this piece of paper. 
you need the success in your business, that's all. Uh, nobody cares which, which school you got the paper from. Uh, as long as you show your talent, your creativity, you're doing things in your own way. So what, the moment you introduce the entrepreneurship into the picture, the whole idea of in, uh, institutionalizing education and so on transform completely. Because many of them don't even have to complete their schools to start their life because they are already capable enough as a young person. Uh, whatever they need to know, they know because they have access to technology and so on. And then they learn as they go around and they can take up any course, anything they need to know and get uh, is a come and go kind of situation. So this is a kind of a picture that you can pro uh, promote on the physical mobility becomes so much easier when you bring the entrepreneurship into the picture, when you become social business into the picture, and that becomes so much easier. Physical mobility, of course, is a question of now, uh, the other issues of the technology, fast movement, so on. How fast do you want to go? Why do you want to go? If it's a job, it's one thing. If it's entrepreneurship, that's one thing. Carry things. Uh, we cannot carry things from the village to the urban city because uh, everything has to be carried to the urban, otherwise you are not, your life is not complete. So we have to change that world. Uh, we are as human beings as in rural area as you are in urban area. Uh, we need our, so you should be mutual. You, you will be carrying things to the village and you will be carrying village to the city. It's exchange, mutual exchange of things that will happen. And in the, in the so, terms of trade should be in our favor, not your favor, because we grow things, you don't grow things. You know, it's been very fascinating hearing you, Dr. Yunus. I'll ask a few personal questions if you don't mind. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, for me, I just had to learn because my hair was growing. I didn't dare to show that. I actually used a scissor to cut my hair. <laughs> I have long hair. Now. I didn't I cut off my ears. So what has been your <laughs> learning during this time? No, I'm uh, still growing my hair. Nobody's growing my hair. <laughs> you can see that. <laughs> so I like that. It's getting longer and longer. Uh, and one last question. I thought I was a big multitasker, but you have completely well, the, a number of things you do together. How do you manage that and still keep laughing? Oh, I mean, it's a fun thing to do. Actually, if you were able, to, if you were able to teach that to all of us, we would have done <laughs> so much better. No, it's so much fun to doing that. It's uh, everything is so exciting because you're doing it the first time and you don't know whether it's going to work, but it's a, you have an idea and you continue to pursue. It and obviously, you fail, but you don't give up. You take it up again, you do it again, and finally it works. And you feel happy that, and everybody feels happy that you do that. And I, I try to exp uh, kind of put it in a sentence by saying that uh, making money may be happiness, but making other people happy is a super happiness. So I'm enjoying that super happiness. Uh, whatever I do is all dedicated to other people. You're the Nothing. super app that people dream of. That is cute. That's it. That's what everybody has entitled to the super happiness. I'm inviting them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We finished. I told you I'll give you back a few minutes of your life. And thank I, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yunus. I'm sure the audience thank has you. enjoyed this one. You left a lot of food for thought for all of us. And we promise that we'll do our best not to go back to that old world. Absolutely. There's an, no way. No go back. No going back. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Dr. Yunus and Mr. Said, for this really inspiring session. Dr. Yunus, you've given us so much to think about. So we will all each have to figure out what to leave behind and apply ourselves to reimagining the future. So thank you so much. We will all thank attempt you. to go back. Thank you. Let's make sure we don't go back. I always listen to the ladies. You told me 243 and it's 243. <laughs> thank you so much, Arun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you. So, audience, please hang on. We have a very interesting keynote coming up. We have with us uh, Rupa Kurva. Rupa leads the Omidia Network India and is responsible for its overall strategy, investments, operations, and portfolio management. Um, prior to joining Omidia Network, uh, Rupa was the CEO of Crystal and led Crystal's transformation in, to become a diversified global analytical company. Rupa served on the boards of several companies, including Infosys, Nestle, uh, IM Ahmedabad. She also has served on several government, regulatory, and policy committees, including SEBI, RBI, and NASCOM. Rupa, thank you so much for sparing time to be with us today. Uh, I know Omidyar has been in the thick of action responding to, uh, responding to COVID and supporting organizations respond to COVID. So over to you. 
Thank you, Lakshmi. It's a real pleasure to be here. And good afternoon, friends. It has now been almost three and a half months since we first detected the COVID cases on our shores. And in no time at all, nonprofit organizations galvanized themselves into action. And we can now see that they are helping India manage not only the pandemic itself, but also the consequent socioeconomic impact. Nonprofits work with the most underserved populations in some of the most difficult to reach areas of India. And today we can see that compared to governments and corporates, the deep reach of civil society organizations positions them really uniquely to serve those who are the worst affected, be it migrant laborers, the homeless, and the urban poor. NGOs have the last mile reach, the trust, the connect, and the capacity to support affected communities that goes well beyond what governments have. While the efforts of the sector are indeed being appreciated, there is limited data and therefore we don't have a macro picture of the range of initiatives that NGOs have undertaken. In today's session, our effort is to bring some data to the table. An analysis of the 1700 funding proposals that we have received under our rapid response funding initiative can serve as a proxy indicator to the mix of initiatives that the sector is engaged in and it provides some really interesting insights. The experience of running the rapid response funding initiative has also allowed us to develop some reflections as a funder and we wanted to share those today with you as well. Omidya Network India is an investment firm focused on social impact. We make equity investments in early stage for-profit enterprises and also provide grants to nonprofits. Our work is characterized typically by a thoughtful and rigorous development of investment thesis and strategies, which can often take several months and even beyond, and very high levels of diligence and selectivity to pick each investee and grantee. So when COVID happened, we soon realized that enabling money to flow quickly to the NGOs was vital as they were at the front line of the relief efforts. But we are a small firm, we have 30 people and our team needed to pay attention to our large portfolio of 94 investees and grantees who, who were under stress due to the pandemic. Moreover, our processes were designed for longer term funding needs. So it was clear that if we wanted to do something meaningful in the short term, a business as usual approach will not work. We therefore launched the rapid response funding initiative on the 24th of March, the day the lockdown was announced. The purpose was to fast track innovation and address urgent needs to respond to challenges of the pandemic and the consequent economic slowdown. The total funding available is 10.75 crore rupees and we consider proposals ranging from 5 lakh rupees to 2 crore rupees. We also publicly committed to an out outer limit of 10 days from the receipt of the proposal to make a funding decision. So what has been the progress so far? In the last 51 days, we have received 1700 applications and processed all of them. 130 have made it past the initial screening. 23 proposals have been approved for 6.3 crore rupees. And if you note the, the row at the bottom, there is still a requirement of 13.7 crore for these proposals, in case there are funders on this call who would like to consider them. Based on these 1700 proposals, we now have a good macro view of how the sector is responding to COVID. Nearly 50% of the proposals focus on community outreach and mobilization. This could be direct relief, awareness building, and ground level monitoring of the virus spread. Most efforts target daily wage earners, especially migrants, both returning as well as those who stayed back. NGOs are distributing relief packs, including food, medicine, and 
and essential supplies. They're also creating local and regional awareness campaigns through multiple platforms, helplines, SMS, and social media. About 33% of the proposals are data, apps, and other tech-led solutions. For example, deploying alternative testing methods and contact, contact tracing solutions. We are seeing solutions that support vulnerable communities, for example, tracking and addressing the needs of migrant workers. For example, Reap Benefit has launched a crowdsourced citizens network that supports local citizens and governments in last mile delivery of healthcare, food, and basic income relief to citizens that need it. Another 10% of initiatives focus on economic resilience of lower income populations, supporting access to government as well as private welfare schemes and also supporting livelihoods. For example, Jan Sahas and Jan Vikas provide holistic support for daily wage earners, particularly those from minority and disadvantaged communities. 5% of the proposals are for research and fact-based inputs that can inform the thinking of policymakers. Vidhi Legal, for example, is developing a data sharing protocol to help government's efforts in sharing and management of citizen data for formulating critical health responses. In narrative building, Gao Connection and Radio Mevat are running interactive campaigns to create awareness of best practices and also broadcasting stories to inform efforts in other regions. We are also really heartened to see collaborative efforts. And here two coalitions are worth mentioning. The first is Action COVID-19 Team, which is ACT, a 100 crore grant fund by over 25 VC firms and the startup community. The second is Rapid Community Response to COVID-19. This originally started off as a national coalition of, of 20 grassroots NGOs and within the last month or so has now grown to 50 and they are focused on managing the pandemic as well as supporting resilience efforts. Now, as we move to the subsequent stages of the pandemic and come out of the lockdown, we are beginning to see some shifts in the areas of focus of nonprofits to the ones listed here, whether it be building the resilience of the small business sector, mental health support, protection against domestic abuse, increasing use of tech in areas like access to justice, reopening supply chains, etc. I also wanted to share some unique examples of contributions that some of our grantees have made during this crisis. These are all grantee, grantees pre the Rapid Response Funding Initiative. We had Jan Sahas' very powerful survey on migrants, which showed that 42% of the workers mentioned that they had no ration left even for one day, let alone for the duration of the lockdown. E-Governments Foundation quickly developed the E-Pass, which helped government manage movement of essential workers during the lockdown. And the Swachhata app, developed by Janagraha is being used to disseminate COVID related information. And finally, we have Give India, which started a large retail funding drive in partnership with Facebook, including the recent I for India concert. Now, all of this shows that NGOs have played a vital role in complementing, supporting and informing government initiatives. Clearly, COVID and its aftermath will have a prolonged and deep impact on our society and economy. But even early into the pandemic, within the first 100 days, many myths about the nonprofit sector are being debunked. We have seen that nonprofits can not only mobilize quickly, but they can even pivot rapidly to provide cost effective solutions. They can leverage technology, traditionally not considered their forte. NGOs can collaborate with each other, contrary to long held perceptions. And above all, NGOs have led from the front, showing admirable public spirit, as well as courage, grit, 
empathy, and boldness to be in the front line at great risk. Their efforts strongly underscore their deep commitment to building an India that is inclusive, caring, and more equitable. Finally, I wanted to share some reflections as a funder. In January 2019, Omidyar Network India spun out of our global parent, Omidyar Network, to become an autonomous India-focused entity with an India-specific strategy. We are highly empowered locally to make decisions, and it is this autonomous organization construct and empowerment that really helped us design the rapid response funding initiative in just three to four days. As I already mentioned, we realized that the goals of the rapid response funding initiative would not be met if we followed a BAU approach. Our screening and approval process, therefore, is very different from our regular approach. There's a simple application process with a two-page form and zero reporting requirements from recipients so as not to burden and distract them during this crisis. Despite heightened demands to support our current portfolio, our team really showed a strong commitment to the RRFI. A small core team of four people has screened 1,700 proposals and created a shortlist. We also provide a 24-hour window for our entire organization to share its views on shortlisted proposals. Our team also made a substantial personal financial contribution to the RRFI. That's a 3.25 crore or one third of the total funding. Like all funders, we have a strong focus on a learning and impact agenda. However, under the RRFI, we are not asking for any reporting from the recipients. And so we are constrained in measuring impact and in getting deep ground level insights. Therefore, our learning agenda became to develop a macro view on the nature of nonprofit responses to COVID, the kind of information I've just shared with you today through robust data capture and a systematic classification of proposals. One important feature of the RRFI is the collaborations that it has formed with other funders and sector leaders. All proposals that make it past our initial screen, as well as our assessments for all approved proposals are being made available to other funders as well as a public good. Do contact us and we'll be happy to give you access to these. Similarly, we are sourcing recommendations from sector leaders to leverage their knowledge. This has enabled us to identify some organizations that would otherwise not ha ever have come to our attention. Indeed, I would say that one of the biggest benefits to us has been the connections to and the awareness of several hundreds of NGOs that we didn't know about earlier. Their efforts are very inspiring. We feel enriched as well as humbled at the same time. We still have 4.5 crore rupees to deploy under the Rapid Response Funding Initiative, and we expect the funding to be fully committed in the next couple of weeks. We will update the data and we will publish our learnings once we close this initiative. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share our insights. I'd like to thank the entire Nudge team and everyone who's on the webinar here today. With that, back to Lakshmi. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and experiences with the RRFI Rupa. Really appreciate it. Um, to the audience, I'm sorry we don't have time on this session to respond to the questions that may be addressed to Rupa. But please feel free to share your questions. We'll collate these questions and try and get back to you with responses subsequently. Um, we will be uh, stopping the plenary session in about a minute now, and we'll be moving to the various tracks. And you can use the Zoom links on the website or the app to navigate to the sessions you wish to attend. Do join us here at 7 p.m. for what I know is going to be a very engaging plenary session with leaders of some of India's largest nonprofits. So until then, take care. See you soon.